Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our text recorded in Matthew chapter 2 verse 11. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. In Jesus' name, amen. Gaspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. Those are the names of the three wise men. Did you know that? Yeah? Or, that's what tradition tells us. First, that there were three, and second, that they had names. Gasper, who's sometimes called Casper, but that sounds too much like the ghost. Uh, Melchior and Balthazar. Now, the only problem with that is, A, the Bible doesn't mention how many of the wise men there were, and B, it certainly does not mention their names. And along with that, let's get this whole king thing off the table. These magi, these wise men, wealthy, mysterious, and powerful that they might be, were certainly not kings. Most likely ambassadors to a king, and most likely, if we were going to pick a place, ambassadors to the king of Persia. What the word magi really means is court astrologer, and thus they were wise counselors, wise advisors to a king, taking their cues from the movements of the stars and planets to foretell what the future might hold for their sovereign. And thus the star, the star of Bethlehem, what again was it exactly? A comet? A planetary alignment? A supernova that grew bright and then exploded soon after Jesus' birth? All of these have been proposed, as well as a few weirder things like UFOs and space, alien spaceship, I kid you not. But we'll get back to that star before we're through. Matthew's Christmas story. The story of Christmas seen only from the perspective of the first gospel of the Bible, the gospel of Matthew. Luke's account is what we hear on Christmas Eve, the taxes, the travel, the manger, the shepherds. But as a boy, I was more fascinated with the Magi, Matthew's Christmas story, and perhaps that mad King Herod, but we'll talk more about him next Sunday. Mom would set up the porcelain nativity on top of the piano. Okay, how many of you have your nativity on top of your piano? I don't, okay, that, that happens. All right. Uh, a piano that I, I loathe to practice and play, which was probably not one of my wisest choices as a kid, because I would love to be able to play the piano today. Anyway, back to the nativity set. <clears throat> so after Mom spent an hour carefully setting up the set, as soon as her back was turned, I would abscond with the wise men. Three of them, of course, camel jockeys, all riding camels, which we can safely assume was their mode of transportation. And these, uh, you know, were all appropriately Mideastern looking, you know, a bit swarmy with uh, these big turbans on their head. You know, no stereotyping in my mom's uh, Christmas nativity. And I would take the wise men and I would position them on the far side of the living room. Because we know, of course, that they weren't there for the actual birth. You know, Christmas came and went, and uh, slowly I would be moving the caravan closer and closer to the nativity. This nerd theologian coming out of me even as a child. You know, and I know mom got it. You know, she understood what I was doing. But she wanted her manger scene to be complete, you know? She kept moving the wise men back, standing right behind the shepherds where they're supposed to stand, right? That Hallmark Christmas card. And I kept moving them away, trying to stay true to the gospel account and the bonus of irritating my mother to boot. Now, it doesn't matter. I think a good and true understanding of what is and what isn't in the Bible, I think that's always a helpful thing, but I do believe that there's something more here as well. Every year as we grew up, 
seemed like there was another story. There was another myth. There was another character added to the Christmas storybook. These things started as a manger and apparently have ended with talking snowmen. You know, a little drummer boy playing rat-a-tat-tat for Jesus. Olaf and the rest of that, that horrible song track frozen in our brains, right? Okay, year after year, more and more is added to the Christmas story. Rudolph and Jack Frost and Elf on a Shelf and more. And yes, that is my Christmas bah humbug. Okay? I got it off my chest. But a plea for parents and grandparents to make sure that your kids know what is the story and what rest is simply stories that are added. What is in the Bible? And what gets added in the minds of men. And, and it's a good thing to know and a good answer to give is simply, you know, mm, that's not in the Bible. That's not in the Bible. But you have to know what's in the Bible to be able to tell your kids and grandkids that. Okay, Rudolph? Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. you. Made my point pretty well. Okay. Because when you whittle down to just the story, the actual Christmas story, there's enough beauty there. There's enough radiance there. The, the story just kind of carries itself if you just tell the story. Now let's start with the star, Matthew 2, 1 through 2. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw... Note the word, his star, when it rose, and have come to worship him. Okay? We have seen his star. Now, wait a minute. Jesus and astrology? That's a little weird, don't you think? Now, in the days of Jesus, in the ancient Mideast, astrology... And the reading of signs in the cosmos was used by the kings as an early warning system. They did not believe that the stars controlled the future, but that the future could simply be read through an accurate understanding of the stars. Now today, horoscopes, astrology, today, these things quite often cross a line. They cross a line into idolatry. They cross a line into believing in something other than God, that something other than God is actually controlling our future. Only God, not the stars, not your horoscope, only God knows what's in store for you. And that's what God was doing with that special star. He was determining the future for these wise men by bringing them to the feet of the only king who actually does have control of the stars and planets and heavens, King Jesus. And I believe that's why the Bethlehem star is exactly what Matthew describes. A special star created by God for one purpose, to bring the wise men where God needed them to be, and ironically where they needed to be as well. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? The wise men asked. So yes, Jesus is already born, as we saw at the end of Matthew chapter 1. And the wise men are here to pay homage. For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And that did not sit well at all with the current king, King Herod. Matthew 2, 3 through 4. When Herod, the king, heard this, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Now the Herod here referred to is Herod the Great. He is half Jew. That plays out in his leadership quite well. Half of what he does is for his people, the Jews. The other half of what he does is for himself, for King Herod. 
And if he ever has a time where he has to choose between doing something for his people, the Jews, or doing for him, something for himself, he doesn't think that much about it. He just chooses himself, and that is one of the times. Matthew 2, 5 through 6. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And on Christmas Eve, I'll talk a little bit more about what does it mean to have Jesus as our shepherd king. King Herod's advisors, wise men, biblical scholars, they knew their Bible, they knew the Old Testament, they knew their Bible a lot better than King Herod did. And they knew that this ancient prophecy, this prophecy came from the book of Micah, when that new Messiah would be born, he would be born in Bethlehem. Why Bethlehem? Well, Bethlehem is the city of David. It's the city where the greatest king of Israel was born, a thousand years before, born in Bethlehem. And like David himself, he too would be that shepherd ruler, that shepherd king to rule the people of Israel. Matthew 2, 7 through 8. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too will come and worship him. Herod was lying. Kings lie. Politicians lie. Herod had no intent on worshiping Jesus. Indeed, as we'll see next week, Herod was intent on killing Jesus. One of Bill O'Reilly's killing books is Killing Jesus, and, and it's a book that I highly recommend. And O'Reilly actually begins his story of the life of Jesus with this story, this first assassination attempt made on the life of Jesus when he was weeks or months old, and that by his own Jewish sovereign, the sitting Jewish king. Matthew 2, 9 through 10. After listening to the king, the Magi went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen, when it rose, went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Now, not to harp on this point, but this is no ordinary star. Now think about that. It certainly was not a comet. This is not a planetary alignment, and it's not a UFO, okay? This star is one of the stars of the Christmas story, and the star appears to have a life of its own. The star rose and went before them, and then it rested over the place the child was, the star itself appearing to worship the one that it shone down upon. Matthew 2, 11. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now note a couple things. The Magi find the boy, find his family, and they find him where? In a manger? In a stable? No, they find him in a house. After that census had been taken, after those who had returned to Bethlehem in order to fulfill their legal obligation moved on, yeah, the couple now had room. There was now room for them in the inn. And that's what an inn was in those days. It was simply a house with an extra room. Definitely not a Motel 6, even if they would leave the light on. And that is where the wise men find the child. And they fell down and worshipped him. Now, folks, we've heard this part of the story so many times that we don't recognize how just simply odd that really is. The demarcation between royalty and peasantry in the ancient Mideast was very, very clear. There were important people, and then there were all the rest of us. And the line between adults and children was also very, very clear. Adults matter. Children no, not so much. No one in their right mind worshipped a baby. And no one 
in their right mind, worshipped a peasant baby who had absolutely no chance of becoming anything. But they did. These wise men did. They fell on their knees and worshipped Jesus and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Born a king on Bethlehem's plain, gold I bring to crown him again, as we sang in the hymn. And yes, gold symbolic of Jesus' royal reign. One of the reasons that gold is such a prominent color during Christmas. But the bag of gold, being the most practical of gifts, or as my children like to remind me every Christmas, money, the gift that keeps on giving, you know. Of the three gifts, the gift of gold was the one that would serve the needs of this young family most in the immediate weeks and months to come. Now, I don't know if you're planning on doing any traveling this Christmas, but it's always expensive, so probably a good idea to bring a bag of gold or two with you. <clears throat> the gold paid in the way for family's flight to Egypt, extended stay away from that crazy King Herod. Again, we'll talk about that next week. Frankincense. Frankincense to offer have I, incense owns a deity nigh. Prayer and praising, glory raising, worshiping God most high. Incense, frankincense, incense connects this newly born king with the prayers and praises of the Old Testament, the worship of ancient Israel, the worship of the temple. It was also used as an anointing of priests. Thus we now have Jesus, priest and king. And then myrrh, myrrh, by far the most symbolic of the three gifts. Myrrh is mine, its bitter perfume, breathes a life of gathering gloom, sorrowing, sighing, bleeding, dying, sealed in the stone cold tomb. What's that doing in a perfectly good Christmas carol? Myrrh, used as a painkiller at the time of Jesus' death. Mark 15, 22 through 23. And they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered Jesus wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. The second time in his life that Jesus was given the gift of myrrh as a painkiller at his death, the gift he refused. And myrrh, used as a perfume to mask the scent of death, preparing the body of Jesus for the grave. John 19.39, Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe about 75 pounds in weight. The third time, Jesus was given the gift of myrrh to mask the scent of death, the gift he could not refuse because he was dead. Jesus, prophet, priest, and king, symbolized by the three gifts of the Magi, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Magi who saw the sign of his star in the east and were wise enough to follow. Magi who listened to King Herod and his own wise men's tales, but were wise enough to keep following the leading of the star. Magi who knew that when you appear before a king, even an infant peasant one, it's best to be prepared, and who were wise enough to bring gifts, gifts to honor that king, but also gifts that foretold the future of that king's life in ways that even the wise men could never have seen. Matthew 2, 12. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another route. Star of wonder, star of night, star with royal beauty bright, Westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. In Jesus' name.